Ani Boju, I'm Holly Bird, Shaskawasakwe and Indishnakaz, Nimki and Dodum, Traverse City and Donjaba, San Felipe Pueblo and Donjaba. I'm Holly Bird, I'm Blue Lightning Woman, I'm uh, Thunder Clan, and I'm from San Felipe Pueblo, but I live in Traverse City. I've, uh, I've addressed you in the language of the, um, the people that live here, the people that are from here, which is the Anishinaabe Moen, which is important to note because um, this is the original language here that's been spoken for thousands and thousands of years. And I'd love to, just with a show of hands, um, to have someone uh, raise their hand and tell me if you know more than three words in Anishinaabe Moen. Anyone? Annabella? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, just want you to know you don't know the language of your land. <laughs> so something to strive for. But what I want to do first is um, I want to do a quick land acknowledgement. Um, I'm not from here. I'm, I, I grew up in Michigan, but I am Pueblo. So I'm not original to this area, although I'm original to this continent and consider myself um, you know, part of the Anishinaabe community um, and the, the community in Michigan. But the land here that, that we live on and that we're staying on now is in the traditional territories of the Odawa, Ojibwe, and the Potawatomi, which we affectionately call the Three Fires um, Confederation or Alliance. Those are colonial terms, but Three Fires people. And um, so it's, it's those ancestors that um, I'm honoring here today. Um, I'm thankful for their, um, for their living. I'm thankful for their, their past and their sacrifice uh, so that we can all be here today. Um, everybody who's here is here because uh, one of our ancestors that are from here uh, gave up their, their right to be here so that you could be here. Okay, or gave up their right to, to reside on this land in some way, shape, or form, whether it was by trick, trickery or agreement or thievery um, or, you know, through, through murder. Um, but they gave up that right to be here so that you could be here. And we have our other presenter, Leora, coming. And then I'm going to introduce our, our panelists really quick. Or actually, I'm going to have them introduce themselves because I think that the more that um, we're able to expose you to the language of this area, the easier it'll be for you to hear in the long run. So, Mr. Otto. Uh, so, through uh, colonialism and um, uh, the takeover of these lands, uh, our, our language has been diminished and, and lost, and I, and I appreciate, I, I don't want to say lost, because it's, it's still there, but, and I uh, appreciate what Holly is uh, doing, but language uh, comes very hard to me, so I haven't uh, learned how to introduce myself in the language. I know that I, I should, uh, but uh, that is just something that I haven't uh, haven't done yet. Um, but my my name is uh, Aaron Otto. Uh, I come from the uh, Little Trappers area, the Waganak Singodawa people, uh, land of the Crooked Tree. So uh, yeah, so uh, I. I was a tribal counselor for Little Travers Bay Bands uh, for eight years. Um, and what that means to my tribe is that I was a legislator. And uh, so I wrote laws and approved regulations and also uh, allocated uh, the money for the government. So that was part of my background. So hey everyone, my Ojibwe name is Red Pipe Woman and my English name is Leora Lancaster. I live over in Ishpeming in uh, Upper Michigan. My res, well my American res, 
is um, Genosha Conning or Place of the Pike, also known as Bay Mills. It's right about here. And my other res, I'm a part of the Okomakung First Nations over in Ontario on Manitoulin Island. I'm gonna do it again. So about eight hours from here, from Marquette. And um, back home, I wear multiple hats. On my mother's side, I'm also Finnish and Sami, the indigenous people of Finland. And so I'm 50-50, you know, learning about those different ways. But living in my home territory, in Anishinaabe King, in Ojibwe territory, um, like I said, I wear multiple hats. I work over at the um, Center for Native American Studies at Northern Michigan University, where I specialize in Anishinaabe Mwen, so Ojibwe language, but I teach indigenous studies. It's really meaningful to me to be able to speak my language because growing up, we didn't have many people around in our community, and I think we have less than five up in the UP that actually speak the language as a first language, and one is incarcerated, so we can't work with them. So it's very, very depleted. So it's, um, it feels really good to be able to introduce myself, being able to use that, you know. So miigwech for everyone for being here today. Miigwech. And um, we were supposed to have a fourth uh, panelist here today, and I want to bring this up because I think it's, uh, it's an important issue. And it's part of the reason that we're here today. Um, our, our fourth panelist was Cecilia Lapointe, who is the executive director of the Native um, Justice Coalition which is an organization dedicated to racial justice, restorative justice, and um, native education uh, type of issues. Um, Cecilia is, uh, is very good at, at um, explaining herself, and I wish she was here to do it, but um, I would ask Leora, do you feel comfortable doing that? Sure, yeah. Okay, because there was an event that happened and, and uh, Cecilia uh, decided not to attend. This, this panel as a result. So I want to share that with everybody by way of a, a learning experience. Yeah, definitely. So I also work for the Native Justice Coalition, but have been asked today to solely represent myself as teaching, um, as an educator, and not on behalf of Native Justice Coalition, which I respect. When we had our friend Cecilia here yesterday, they had come into a bit of racism and a little bit of cultural appropriation, which is a really difficult thing to talk about in some spaces, which I think it's really important that here there's a lot of, seems to be a lot of open minds and open hearts to be able to have that difficult dialogue. And um, so it was just a little bit too intense for them to be able to be in this space. And they also walk a very sober road. You know, they, they walk the red road along sobriety and wellbriety. So that was very, a bit difficult for them to be around all that intensity also, which I respect. You know, everyone has their own path. And so I guess myself being here without them, it is a little bit um, disheartening, you know, but I understand why they're not here today. And I hope to just be able to have those open conversations if folks do have questions on cultural appropriation or native ideology or any of that kind of stuff because it's very important that now that we're legally able to have those conversations about anything from our language you know to our religions post-1978 so to be able to have those safe spaces and those conversations is really really important and Leora can you share with us what the specific examples were that were that, that felt um, offensive and, and damaging. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the one that comes to my mind um, the most that resonated with me is there was an individual that had dressed up like a Native American, you know, which is mm, it's very pro problematic in different layers, you know, but the first and foremost is cultural appropriation is a difficult thing to talk about. But if you don't understand something fully, then it's very difficult to portray that in a good manner, you know? And it wasn't as intense as a headdress, which is from the Plains tribes, which as we know, there's how many federally recognized nations as of 2018? Anybody know? Any guesses? <laughs> Around 500? Yep. Yeah. So 573. And only 16 of those are Plains nations. And we're in Eastern Woodlands. So it would be wildly dangerous to have a headdress, but at least it wasn't a headdress, but it was um, uh, like a fake regalia and a rattle, which a rattle in our territory is a sacred ceremonial item. So to take it out of context and to have it in kind of a recreational way is very disrespectful. 
So when our tribal people see these kinds of things out of context, it's very hurtful, you know. So um, especially if you have very traditional people or elders. And so I can understand why certain individuals don't want to be around that kind of cultural appropriation. And just to, to bring that to like a full circle for people, um, a lot of people perhaps in this room and even some of us have grown up uh, under a colonial mindset of either Christianity or um, colonialism, uh, Catholicism. I don't say those things too separately, <laughs> but, and there's other religions, but um, imagine perhaps someone you know that is not a Christian person or is not a Catholic person coming to a festival wearing a nun's habit for fun, mm -hmm. you know, and, and carrying around a cross and shaking it like it's, you know, yeah. something fun and funny. So that's sort of what's happening. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening for us in that context. And it could be even more layered because of the intergenerational trauma that indigenous people have because of the boarding school era, which a lot of us are still finding out about and learning about, even in, within our tribal communities. You know, a lot of us, we kind of cradle emotionally and physically our elders because of the harsh lives that they had to endure within the boarding school and residential school life. And so when they finally got that religious freedom back in 1978, and they were able to have their ceremonies without getting arrested, quite literally, or abused, or a number of things. And you have these elders today, and you see them um, actually own up and say, and have that pride and say, I am indigenous, and they know their nation, and they can say a couple of words, you know, that's very empowering to them. Some of them even reclaim their traditional Anishinaabe names legally, which is really wonderful. To, but to see them be so hurt, when they see their culture misrepresented in that way, is very disheartening, it's very hard. So it's very layered, you know, it's very layered. Right, and just by way of example, my own grandmother who, um, she lived till she was 92, or 102. Wow. But she would not admit uh, she was Native American and she was full-blooded <laughs> until she was 92. But she came from a place where you know, to be Native American was to be beaten or killed or um, enslaved or something, you know. And even, even living up here in, uh, in Michigan, she's, she was far from where her people were from. She did everything that she could to become American because she didn't, she was trying to escape that. Mm -hmm. And you know, how do you escape yourself? Imagine trying to do that. I would, I would never ask my daughter not to be who she is because any, anybody, I mean, we see what it does to everyone um, who is oppressed, whether it's, you know, a native person, whether it's a, um, someone who's LGBTQ, I mean, the suicide rate in those communities is huge for that reason, and, but it's the same for us. Actually, our rates are much higher for suicide. So. When we see things like that happen, and you know, I kind of want to go like this to my daughter and, and shield her eyes, but I don't. I explain it to her. You know, I, I'm pretty certain they don't mean it, but we, you need to know what that is. Mm -hmm. So, um, what I'd like to do too, and, and I wanted to acknowledge that point because uh, Cecilia did decide not to be here. That was a really hard thing for her to see. It was re it was hurtful to her, and while I'm sure the people that did it didn't mean to be hurtful. It's something that we all need to learn from. And, and um, as if you're here and you're non-native and you see that happening, call it out. You know, that's, that's part of justice. That's part of saying, you know, that's, that's really not okay. You know, it's, you're hurting somebody. So call it out and, and we'd appreciate that. So, um, and I wanna, I wanna give prayers and kudos to, to Cecilia for also walking her walk and um, making her statement here that she felt she needed to make. So, um, one of the questions I want to bring up, though, moving on, um, is the concept of native justice. It's it's really variable and it means different things to different people. And so, I'm going to ask each of you, you know, what what do you feel for yourself or for your community? What is native justice? What is justice for Native Americans? <laughs> So, uh, 
Well, first, just for some perspective, uh, how many native people do we have in the in the room right now? You're just to show of hands. Woo-hoo. Okay, so our representation in this room right now is probably fivefold of what it is in the country. Native Americans make up less than one percent of the population in the U.S. So. Uh, It is, uh, it is important for people to understand that and to, to, to know that with this minimal amount of people, uh, you know, we're the minority of minorities in this country and we're the people that were here originally. And to, to fight for that justice, whatever that appears to be um, coming from 1% of the people here, you know, we have to be very loud. We have to be very visible. And sometimes that can come across as uh, abrasive or uh, aggressive. But, uh, you know, when, when you're that small of a group, Sometimes that's what's needed in order to get heard. Uh, so, but the, the idea of justice to me, uh, for one, my tribe right now is uh, fighting for uh, the rights that they had set forth in their treaty that they made with the US government uh, and getting their uh, reservation boundary uh, recognized uh, again. It's always been there, but uh, through stealing and um, uh, misuse of government law, U.S. government law, and uh, trickery and all of those things, uh, our uh, reservation land has seemed to disappear but it hasn't, it's still there. Uh, We believe that. Um, So, you know, honoring the things that the government has, that the US government has promised, you know, that's that's a major major component to what I feel some of this justice is. Uh, Protection of our children and the Indian Children um, Welfare Act, uh, commonly known as ICWA. Uh, You know, there there are people uh, in this country that are continually trying to chip that away and taking as many of uh, their cases to the federal government to take away that uh, to chip away at that law so that native kids can be adopted out to non-native families and this destroys that cultural lineage that um, that we continue to try and instill in our children uh, but you know to us to that small group of people you know, we need every person in our culture to be able to pass down that knowledge down to the other, you know, to the next generation. And if they're being removed and put into another uh, family who doesn't know anything about our culture, you know, even if they're sympathetic, you know, they're not able to teach those things. They're not able to... uh, spread that knowledge. So uh, with the Indian Child Welfare Act, you know, it, it, um, you know, it helps us to uh, continue that knowledge. So you know, just fighting for these things constantly and, and uh, it's, it's tiring, it, 
it's aggravating. Um, but you know, with help from other people uh, to increase that, um, increase that voice instead of it just being, you know, one percent of the population uh, screaming and shaking their fist and saying, "Look, we need you know you to listen to us." Uh, if we have more people doing that, that helps. But within that, we need to make sure that those people are doing it in a respectful manner to the native people as well. So there's, you know, there's some tricky things in it, but uh, yeah. So, I mean, those are right now for me, two of the biggest uh, things that uh, take up my my mind are the Indian Child Welfare Act and the you know recognizing uh, the agreements that we have made and having those uh, honored. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> And I think I'm going to piggyback off that, too, because you made some really, really great points. You know, what does Native justice mean to you? And for me, the top two things that come to mind are, are simple, but they're very layered. You know, and the first one is just existence. Existence as an indigenous person today is resistance. It definitely is, you know. If you are an indigenous person, then you being here today is a miracle. Your ancestors had to go through so many different things, but you're here and you are beautiful. You know, you always have to remember that. And um, the second thing, because I come from the world of academia, you know, I'm always thinking of how to progress and, and add an indigenous perspective within the curriculum. And so I think education is a huge, as corny as it sounds, education is a huge part of native justice because um, when we first started going into the boarding school era over in Carlisle, Pennsylvania with Richard Henry Pratt, you know, the, the national motto, kill the Indian, save the man, that was the national motto of America. And these children had to endure very, very harsh conditions. And not all the time, these, these little ones made it back home. You know, there are hundreds, literally hundreds of unmarked graves for these kids that never made it back home. And they will never be, um, you know, served justice. So today, when we have all of these freedoms to be able to talk about these things and to learn, we really need to know those stories, these true stories of hundreds of nations, because there really wasn't very many nations that wasn't affected by assimilation efforts of America. You know, unless you were very, very geographically isolated, then you were definitely affected. And so when we, um, when we educate ourselves on our histories, our traditional histories, not just our history coming up with colonization, that's a huge thing because then that gets us into the concept of decolonization. And decolonization is a huge aspect of, aspect of um, social justice in regards to indigenous peoples and our life ways because there's so many different layers to decolonization. You know, you can decolonize maybe your clothing, you can decolonize your diet, you can decolonize your travel or your architecture, but the hardest thing is to decolonize your mind. That's a very, very difficult thing, and especially if you're first and foremost an English speaker growing up within um, Western kind of educational systems, you know. For indigenous perspective, we have potentially the month of November, and that's it, and that's misconstrued information because our educators don't have the tools quite yet to be able to talk about it in an authentic way. Now we're changing that, you know, because we're working with the state of Michigan right now, Northern Michigan University is, to include some more state standards, you know, within the curriculum, and also creating a language certification for teachers so they can teach K through 12 public school systems. Because right now in the state of Michigan, we have three people, literally three, upstate and downstate that are uh, qualified to teach Ojibwe, Potawatomi, or Adawa language within public school systems. And so we don't have a pathway quite yet. So also, if it's not within the standards, why are they going to push it within our education systems, right? So we have a lot of native and non-native children that aren't exposed to the language at all, which, when you go to France, what do they speak? French. When you go to Japan, what are they going to speak? Japanese. 
When we're in Anishinaabe, a king, what do we speak? English. So we've got to, um, you know, keep fighting for these kinds of things because they're very important things. So the biggest thing for me for social justice in, in, in an indigenous way is to be able to learn how to see the world through an indigenous lens. And that's so multifaceted. I do want to just add to uh, the language education. Uh, my tribe has worked um, closely with our uh, local high schools, so Petoskey High School and Harbor Springs High School. Uh, and I'm not sure if it's going on right now, but for uh, a good few years there, we did have an Anishinaabe Moan class available in, the, in both of those high schools. And our uh, local community college as well has an Anishinaabe Moan class um, to expose non-natives and to have a place for uh, our people to go and learn the language. So. Um, yeah, so uh, my tribe has worked to get that, that going locally for us. And I always say if you're, you know, if you're into decolonization, if you're into the climate and the earth, loving this place, because I know you do, I know all of you love this place, you can't help it, right? Then you would learn the language of the spirits of this place. The language of the water is an Anishinaabe Moan. The language of the land is an Anishinaabe Moan. You know, that's, that's what they understand here. And it's not that they're not gonna understand your hearts, but it really helps for communication, right? So if you, if you wanna start becoming part of this land and making this your, your home, that's, you, you learn how to communicate with it. Because that's about healing the trauma within you. you. The people that came from Europe and other places, they have a huge trauma for, what, for leaving where they're from. They left their ancestors, they left their families, they left the spirits that they already knew for centuries, and they came here. And that's a huge trauma. And, and we see a lot of people that are non-native as wandering, you know, wandering, looking for home. But you can't do it unless you know the language, right? So I want to bring up a couple things, though, and that's why I'm so appreciative of what you do, Leora. I mean, it's, it's so important. And we do need to have language in all of the schools, as far as I'm concerned. I, I laugh because, well, I'll go around to the grocery stores, and I'll be like, ah, miigwech, you know, like, thank you. And my kids will be like, they don't know what you're talking about. And I'm like, yeah, but they should, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And, and I'll, I'll say it anyway, or I'll say miigwech, thank you, you know, so somebody can understand. But, um, and I don't limit it just to that. I, you know, obviously I still have to get along in the world and I don't know the language that well, but I try. And that's what you do, you try. So, um, but the other thing I wanna bring up, um, and, and this is just some facts, this is at your education. Um, we were only allowed to, we, we only became citizens of the US in the late 60s. We only were allowed to practice our religion without persecution, and this is under fire now, I want you to know this. It's, it's, it has not been perfected at this point. In 1987. 78. I'm sorry, 78, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm also mm -hmm. dyslexic. <laughs> 1978. But actually, through the case law that we've had, <laughs> this is the lawyer part, it wasn't perfected until 1982. And, but it's under fire again. Because when we see things like Bears Monument, all of our sacred places that are being um, open for mining or, or uh, being built upon or taken, that is a direct violation of our religious freedom. So those are the places where we worship. So um, the other aspect, we were um, sterilization Forced sterilization of Native American women only became illegal in 1982. I have aunties in their 60s and 70s that were sterilized. Okay? The boarding schools, the last boarding school in your area, and I think Harbor Springs is probably the closest, only closed like, what, 25 years ago? I know 35, 40-year-olds that were abused in those boarding schools. So this isn't something that happened 500 years ago. I just want you to know, it's still fresh. It's still current. We're still 
experiencing this. We're still traumatized. And we're dealing with the fallout. You know, as a judge, I see this all the time. And, and I have to have a lot of patience for the people that come in front of me because I know, I see the family trauma, I know the histories of the family and what, what's gone on there. Either someone was removed to a boarding school and missed out on a whole generation of parenting. You know, so then we have kids, they're still having kids though, and then we have what I call the jellyfish parents. Um, they, they, can't, they can't parent very well. They love, but they can't parent well in a way that traditionally worked for our people. And the way we did it traditionally is what works for our people best. Otherwise, it, we, we find a lot of dysfunction when we try to conform to the other ways. Or people try to make us, you know, you gotta, you gotta do it the best way. That's what we're told all the time. The best way is to do this. It's always a white way, right? And, but that's not what works for us. So um, those are just some facts that I, that I want you to know. And, and as I said, it's continuing. It's continuing. We still had, um, under ICWA, three years ago, there, um, out west, there was a Supreme Court case that found that the state of North Dakota took away ch native children at a 100% rate of removal without notice to the parents, and only 50% of any, any other family that was non-native and those people had notice. When I say notice, that means the parent was given notice that there's a proceeding to take their children away. And we're talking about parents that were just coming home and finding them gone and not knowing what happened. So this is, they were genocide, sued. Yeah, it's genocide. We created, it's interesting because Eleanor Roosevelt, one of our, our president's wives helped create the International Charter of Human Ra Rights and it includes some of these definitions of genocide, which is everything that's been done and is continuing to be done to our people. But the U.S. never signed it. And why do you think that is? Still a holdout. I think they were the last ones. I th well, now we're not time. the U.N. anymore. Well, that's true. <laughs> but there's a reason, right? Because they don't want to be responsible for, what, cause for what's happening and what's still happening. We see things like Standing Rock. When you take a pipeline and you initially are gonna put it 10 miles from Bismarck and they have a little town hall meeting with all the Bismarck people that are predominantly white ranchers and they say, no, we don't want it there. And then you go through two years of litigation and a 20,000 person protest after they want to put it on, over the only water source for a whole Standing Rock Sioux Nation, which is a huge reservation and they still do it anyway, and they get the endorsement of the president to do that, that is genocide. That is not justice. It's happening still every day. So, um, I, and I hear this a lot from people, and, and you know, this part of my role is to help educate. Not all of us are meant to educate, okay? Some of us don't, don't wanna deal with it at all. We're, we're just trying to survive and live, right? But we're, here, we're up here because we have that interest and, and um, many have those talents, you know, that they can do this in a good way. Um, but I'm, I'm giving you those examples because I hear that a lot like, oh, what are you griping about? You know, that happened, that, that wasn't my, that, I have nothing to do with that. I, I'm not oppressing you. My answer, I'm not responsible for what people did 500 years ago. And I'm like, well, yeah, but you all are. You know, you're, you're part of the system that's doing it and you're benefiting from that system. So anywhere else in the world, if you had a court case that involved, you know, a plaintiff that was cross-sued by somebody else but they're benefiting off of a, you know, a bad contract that was hurting somebody else, they would be responsible, even if they didn't mean to be, if that makes sense, but you are. So I just want to bring that up because it's about justice and that's what the panel is about. Um, it's not to to bash anybody over the head, but it's really just to let you know where we're coming from. We're coming from a place of, of still fighting, still trying to exist. So in that, in that vein, um, I'd like to get a couple of like real life examples where maybe you saw justice happen. And, and perhaps what these fine people could do to help justice come about for us. Because what happens to us can happen to you, honestly. 
It's a hard one, I know. I know, I, I keep thinking it's bad, but I keep thinking of all the injustices that I'm like, shoot, something good. Think of something good. Right. Uh-huh. Hmm. It's not a I huge... Need... Oh, you go ahead. No, I was just, I may need a minute to <laughs> think about it. Not on a communal level, but I want to give a kind of a sweet example of my grandma. And it's a little bit more of a personal example. My grandma, she, um, her name is Hilda Otokwajuan. She's from Mokomakong First Nations on Manitoulin Island. And she is this amazing woman. She, said, she doesn't admit that she went to a boarding school, but she went to St. Mary, um, Mary's Catholic School for Girls. That was totally a boarding school. And um, she still says that she's Catholic to this day because she has too much fear to say otherwise. But within the past five years, I was so proud of her. She's learning her language. She goes every single Wednesday to Munising to go and sit with these elders. About five people the same, five people every time. One of those teachers had just walked on in our community. But um, she, within the same past five years, she legally changed her last name from Lewis to Otokwajuan, which is her Adawa name. And I thought, Grandma, right on. You know, that's a really good thing. And so now, Within our family, she never learned the language because it was dangerous. It was very dangerous for her. Her parents, they both spoke, but they would only speak um, the language when they were fighting with one another or when they were drunk, you know? So it stopped with her and she never taught, or she never learned, so she never taught her children. So then of course, she was one, or she had 11 children. My father's one of 11, so all of their kids never learned. So I didn't learn until I went to university with my brother my older brother Levi. And um, so my kids, I'm teaching them. I have two little boys, a five and eight year old, Quinn and Shiloh, two hilarious, wonderful, disgusting boys. And um, so they're learning the language, but they don't feel comfortable learning it and using it everywhere, I should say. You know, there's only quote unquote safe spaces for them to use their language where they don't feel ostracized. And with them going to school, public school, because I'm a working single mother. They have to go to public school, I can't homeschool them. And um, they don't feel comfortable speaking their language there. But um, a really cool thing was my older son, when he was going to school with, his name was Chad Kemp, this really, really great non-native ally within the school systems. And he was one of those cool teachers who would text on his, his watch. And so I, I would give him one word in the language each day to use freely in the classroom. And it could just be nonchalantly, whether it was chair or cat or whatever it was, but he would use it in front of all the kids and very nonchalantly so that my son would hear and see that and say, oh my gosh, somebody's speaking Ojibwe outside of my family in school, this is so cool. So immediately that created a safe space so the teacher realized he was using Ojibwe more. You know, so little things like that. And to tie that back to my grandma, and I let you all know that all these different generations do not know the language. So it's finally taking my five-year-old, it's normal for him to say, instead of Grandma Hilda, he says, Nokomis. That's our word for grandma in the language. And he's the first kid within all the grandkids, all the kids, all the great grandkids to finally be able to call her a Nokomis and have it be normal without having to think about it. So that's a teeny tiny little bit of decolonization, and that feels really, really good, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and Aaron, I hate to say real quick, but, you know, because we're native and we don't talk quick. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we've got about a minute. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, the, the thing that's coming to mind right now, and it's not necessarily uh, over with yet, but... Um, a, a loud voice in our community, her name is Janan Cornstock, uh, has gone to our uh, local governments uh, for Emma County to, um, to uh, change uh, Columbus Day to uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. And uh, they are considering the vote next, uh, in two weeks. And uh, just to even get it on the agenda to, to be voted on is an amazing thing, particularly in that community, uh, which is very um, conservative-based 
uh, community. So uh, I have great um, hope that uh, it passes. I, I think that I, I actually think that it that it may. So um, I guess my justice is coming in a couple couple weeks, uh, a little bit. Awesome. So I'm gonna give a just.